Hello, hello, and welcome to Cut to Reveal, a podcast where we discuss the editing art form and all hurdles that come with that career path. My name is Piotr, and I'm here with my co-host, Ricky. Ricky, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Peter and I both edit for a living, and while our experience and path are different, we both share a love for filmmaking. And even more importantly, we have a strong focus on improving our editing skills. We know that even though you can learn to do basic editing in like a few days, it really takes a lifetime to master. Yeah, and that's what the podcast is all about. Today, we want to talk about what makes some editors worth more money than others. I don't know if you had this observation, but sometimes people are able to charge a lot, even though they don't have that much experience. Have you noticed such a thing? The people that I know that charge large amounts, there's good reason for them to be able to charge as much as they do for many different reasons that we're going to talk about in this episode. But in regards to like less experienced people charging more, actually, I haven't seen any of that. So I, you need to tell me where, you, where you've seen that because that's crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah, that that you see that that's guys our podcast where we we do have different background. <laughs> so Ricky, uh, like quite often disagrees with me, which is great. <laughs> and yeah, I actually do see it not only in editing but in other areas of life that sometimes there there are people that like are in the beginning of their career path and already are charging a lot. And there are people who have like 20, 25 years of experience that charge as as much as someone who just started. So yeah, I, I've noticed uh, that trend. And yeah, I, I think I, I can actually explain it to you in a moment. Peter, before we start, do you want to talk about what's new on your YouTube channel? Oh, yeah. I, I think there will be a video I actually worked on for quite a long time about the reality of sound editing. So in that video, I also feature a part of an interview that we will publish on the podcast in two weeks with Francis Parker, the editor uh, for The Crown, one of the episodes of The Crown, actually a few of the, of the episodes, but especially the one I'm interested in. The reality of sound editing is something that I find super, super interesting. Like how we as editors have to think about how sound propagates in air and how a given line is being said if it's a secret, for example, and it should be kept a secret from another character, but the character is visible on the screen and things like that. So yeah, that's what the video is going to be about. Yeah, that interview is fantastic. Obviously, she is a talented editor working on those shows, but also she has a, a very interesting perspective, I thought. Yeah, a few answers she gave actually did surprise me. Like, for example, the one about difficult producers. Uh, yeah, so I, but that's for you guys to listen to uh, in two weeks. Okay, I think that's pretty much it for the channel. Yeah, shall we start? Let's start. I will start with the first factor that allows some editors to make more money than others, which is unfair advantage. So if you have some kind of unfair advantage over the rest of the market or the rest of um, the crowd, you can charge more. Ricky, do you have any ideas about what the unfair advantage could be about? It could be the amount of years. It could be the people that this person knows in their network. I mean, those would probably be the biggest things. It's kind of who you know and what you can do. Also, right place, right time. Yeah, knowing the right people. Often people say, if only I would know someone in the industry. And that's one of the unfair advantages. So that's actually correct. If you do know someone in the industry on the right level and you have that connection built with them, it can result in a fruitful collaboration. But I think there are like other things. For example, being geared up with everything you need for like 100% remote editing workflow. Let's say a director in this COVID era wants to have an editor uh, that he doesn't even want to meet with in the same room. If you are someone who, who has all the gear and all the software and all the things that need to happen for such 100% remote workflow, I think that's, a, that's an example of unfair advantage. I agree. It made me think about when I lived in Chicago, I worked in a specific area, a kind of a niche that really didn't see the a public eye. And then when I moved to Denver, I became essentially like a, a digital asset manager, which is 
for lack of a better term, a librarian of all the footage that was coming into this house. Uh -huh. I mean, the job didn't suck, but it was, I wasn't getting paid very well. It was kind of a, kind of a shit show. Regardless, I ended up getting uh, a job at actual production house, like a commercial production house because of a friend of mine who was working there and said, Hey, you should talk to this guy. He has experience editing and blah, 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 blah. But the thing that really got me the position, at least I think, is that the software that we use for encoding at this job that wasn't really an editing job was something that pushed me kind of over the line for the person who was interviewing me. And so much so that when I was talking with them and they said, do you know this program? And I was like, oh yeah, I use it every day where they were like kind of taken aback, like, oh, you know this. Okay, great. So, and then I think from there, that's kind of what put me head and shoulders above anybody else. And eventually I got the job and you know, the rest is history. So they say, but uh, yeah. I think that even the smallest jobs that you don't think are significant, you're learning something that might be significant to whatever your next job is. Oh yeah. You never want to disregard anything or yeah. think that you're above something because there's potential in anybody that you meet and any skill that you can learn on a new job to help you in the future. Oh yeah. Uh, that's a mindset I definitely like subscribe to. <laughs> yeah. Such an example is definitely a good one. It applies to all the skills, you know, in order for the advantage to be unfair, it has to be something that differentiates you from, from the crowd. So yeah, if you know a piece of software or if, for example, you know how to do a great sound design, as an editor, you can distinguish yourself from others with things like that. So yeah, so that's the first point on fair advantage. And there are like many examples. I'm sure listeners can, can come up with their own ideas about what it should be, what it could be in their case. The second one, the second factor, I guess, is social proof. So what do I mean by that? I think that sometimes a producer or just a creator who wants to hire you needs to see th that you have been doing things like that for others. So social proof, like, you know, the things that we put on our websites where we claim that we work for that company and for that one and for that one, these are all mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. pr proof factors. And the more you have it, the clients will automatically think that you will charge a good amount of money if you worked with a lot of people and if you have proof that you did. Uh, but it can also be, for example, in my case, my social proof is also YouTube, like running a YouTube channel. It's actually mm -hmm. social proof. You know, people see that I've done all these videos and if someone likes them, then there is a good chance they will actually think that, okay, that guy has to charge a lot because he does a lot of stuff and things like that. I don't know. Maybe that's not a good example, and I'm not saying that it works all the time, but it's better to have it than not to have it, basically. So that's an example of social proof as well. Anybody who works in at least the film industry that doesn't have some sort of reel, whether they be an editor, a sound person, yeah. producer, scriptwriter, whatever, and they don't have something to show their work, you can't expect new clients to just believe your word because you think you're an honest person or because you do have the experience regardless. That's, to me, that seems just, just crazy why you yeah. wouldn't. Yeah, although I think that actually like the editing reel is not something that is very useful. I mean, I may be wrong. I come from the point where I don't actually have the editing reel myself, but I'm saying that it's not something that distinguishes you from the crowd, in my opinion, because like almost everyone, as you said, does have it. Unless it's very good, unless it's different, then I think it's just something that the client will, will like, you know, think that you have to have, but it won't allow you to charge more in a way. I think that a reel is more for new clients than existing clients, mm -hmm. depending on what the job is. I always say, these are my rates and then it's negotiable. This is the amount of money that I'm not gonna go below because uh -huh. I mean, my skills are worth more than that. And then if you go past a certain point, then you're basically really doing a disservice to the industry that you work in, where you're just lowballing yourself, where it's making it so like nobody can make any money. Yeah, yeah, actually I do disagree with that. So <laughs> this time I have to disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think there is nothing wrong in charging close to zero. Seriously. Uh, I know that people say it, 
it harms the industry and it harms other people. But I think it's it's just the free market and you have to live by reality of, of how free market works. The funny thing is that clients don't want the cheapest product. At least most of the clients don't want the cheapest product. What they want is like, they want to be sure that someone will deliver something, the, the thing that they promised they to deliver and things like that. So I, I, I don't think that charging a small amount is actually a problem. Uh, but I think that to be able to charge a lot, you do have to have these things that we talk about in this in this episode. And if I were to build a reel to like maximize your earning potential, so to speak, in my opinion, you have to prepare like a customized reel. So if you throw a generic reel with all the clients you worked for and things like that to a client, you're just one of many. But if you prepare a customized reel, that is something that is very specific to what they're looking for, then I think your negotiating skills and your negotiating position is so much better. I mean, I agree. I've, I agree. And the reason is because I have lost jobs or at least wasted my time going in and talking to people who saw my reel, knew that I could do something, but because they didn't see specifically what they wanted, okay. they didn't think I was qualified. Yeah, exactly. Rather than that, I think it's usually better to pinpoint like very specific things you've done and just show them what they need, nothing else. And this way, even though the, the reel will be shorter and the amount of clients you brag about will be shorter, uh, the list of the clients will be shorter, it still will work better if, for, for your negotiating position in a way. Now, let me ask you this then, these scenarios where you would create a custom reel yeah. Is it you creating a custom reel just out of habit? Like this is a client that I want, I'm going to approach them and this is what I see. Or is it the client coming to you being like, we want to use you. Do you have any work mm -hmm. that is this specifically? And then after that conversation is when you would cut this reel for them. Oh yeah. So that's a very good question. And I think it depends on, on the stage or of your career in a way. The best situation is where you actually in my opinion at least, is not to wait for the client to come to you, but to find the client you want to work for. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in such a case, uh, I would go uh, the route of creating a custom reel specifically for them, like proving okay. to them that you are someone that they need. But obviously there are other scenarios. So if I were uh, approached by a company that, you know, pitches me a gig and asks me about my rate and things like that, and the project seems interesting, but at the same time, I get an impression that I'm not the only one they are asking for, and I do want to work on this project, then I would do it as well. But mm. if it's more like I'm at the stage where I'm having like, you know, five clients that I work for uh, at any given time and uh, I work on short projects for them and the projects are, aren't are that complicated and things like that, I wouldn't bother for in, in such a case. I would just send something generic that I have, uh, you know, my previous projects and things like that, like uh, contacts to my other clients, but I wouldn't bother to create a custom reel in such case. But once you want to get a client you actually desire to have, you know, or work on a project mm -hmm. you desire, uh, I think it's always best to be to to work on that custom, real and custom social proof for that client. I usually work with the same clients and over and over again, so I'm not having the problem of having to create new reels every time uh -huh. unless I've done enough work that is interesting enough to put in a reel. I have had where those clients, they come to me and be like, we're putting together a group of people that we want to display. Like these are the people that we work with. So then their mm -hmm. clients can see these are the editors we work with. Here's some stuff that they've done. And then they can pick like, okay, we're going to use Ricky for this job, or we'll use Peter for this job. So usually yeah. I don't have to create a reel. And I don't know if that's just because I'm I don't yeah, know if I, that's just because I'm lazy <laughs> no, no, I don't <laughs> because I just so. get so used to it's the same with like a resume or a CV. I haven't had to make one in so long 
And just yeah. the thought of having to make one now is like, oh my God, it's so exhausting. But it's just because oh. I have a client. I mean, I have a great client base that I always yeah. get to work with, which I, who I love working with. In my opinion, it just proves the point that mm -hmm. usually you don't need real as an editor. If you have built these those relationships and you've done it well, like in your case, Ricky, then mm -hmm. you know, you probably use your reel very, very rarely. Yeah, that's just the way it works. So if you know, someone's listening who's early on, on their editing path. Don't think that like creating a reel will actually bring you a lot of clients. It's good to have it, but it's not something essential. You know, like building relationships is m far more important and pitching well to clients, but you don't have to pitch with a reel. You can pitch with your excitement about the project sometimes even. You know, the clients want to see that you're excited about their project. That's just the way it is. Yeah, I think that a reel is important for a couple of reasons. First, creating a reel improves your skills, not just for the client, just for you. I also agree with you that you don't necessarily need a reel to get a job. That excitement will overshadow or can overshadow the reel. It's all important, but it depends on the client and depends on the time and period. And there's so many factors that kind of all play into together. Yeah. I think that it's important to have it so that you do have it, but it's like you said, it's not a necessary, it's not a necessity. Yeah. Hey, we are deviating from the topic a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, so let's veer <laughs> so, back onto the road here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the third factor that will allow you to charge more than others is just your negotiating skills. And actually, I want to recommend a book to anyone who's listening. The book is titled Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Uh, he's a former FBI negotiator and he has written a, an amazing book, in my opinion. Because like I've always thought about negotiating as as bargaining. Mm -hmm. And and he explains like very clearly that it's not the same thing at all. So Bargaining is not something you want to do ever. So you don't want to ever bargain with a client. You want to negotiate with them. And what does it mean? How, how do we negotiate? Negotiating is just about asking the right questions so that the second party like realizes what value you can provide. Okay. So you don't have to prove to them that, I don't know, for example, like, you can ask about their previous experiences with editors. Were they happy about their previous uh, editors? And then they will tell you right away that, for example, oh, we are looking for a new editor uh, because the previous one missed the deadlines or the previous one, his communication sk skills weren't good enough or things like that. And then you are fitted with ideas about how you can prove yourself to them. What are the things that they're looking for in the editor? So just asking the right questions basically is negotiating. And then you can drive the conversation and drive the conversation in a way that proves you in their eyes. Okay. I recommend you read it as well. Read it. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to pick it up. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say my experience in regards to like negotiating is, yeah, it, yeah. is very simply speaking, being able to identify something that isn't also going to benefit you. So that mm -hmm. even if you want to work for this job and they come back to you and they say, well, we're going to give you this much, you should be able to, or you should feel safe in being like, I like what you're telling me. I want to work for you, but this salary is what I'm getting paid now. And it doesn't work for me. And these are the reasons why. I guess my point is that you should be honest about when you come to the table for this oh, yeah. negotiation. About yeah. Yeah. Being reasonable. Like I talked about getting a raise when I worked in the post-production house and you know, I, I've never just said that I want to raise. Like I, I always started the conversation with, you know, the value I can provide and why uh, I, I have to charge more for that and things like that. So yeah, I, I totally agree. Right. So, and it's also where you're at in regards yeah. to like actual physical location. So if you work in Denver or you work in New York, the amount of money that you'd be paid for like an, an editor position or an assistant editor position or vastly different. You yeah. should bring that knowledge to the table. Oh yeah, that's true. Like the cost of life is different. So <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. 
So the thing I want to leave the audience with, I guess, is that people hate the bargaining. So you, you don't want to be someone who says like, you know, I, I want 50 bucks more. <laughs> you don't want to be the, the, that person. But people actually, I think, like to negotiate. And I think negotiating is like almost needed because if the client negotiates with you and then you settle on an agreement, then they also get a feeling that they got a good deal. So that's what you're looking for. You want to, to find yourself in a place where you're getting what you want, but at the same time, the clients feels that they get what they want and it wasn't easy for them to get you, uh, you know, working on a project in a way. I don't know if it makes sense. Hope it does. I think that makes sense. Maybe we'll play it back and it won't make sense, but it makes sense right now. <laughs> if so, we'll just re-record it. But okay, before we continue... <laughs> <laughs> okay, but before we continue, I, I guess we will do a short ad break, shall we? Let's do it. Cuts to Reveal podcast is brought to you by The Editing Chef, a course for editors who seek to maximize their creative productivity and streamline the editing workflow. The course introduces tips and techniques that will help you edit more efficiently and therefore make it more enjoyable. Plus, it will delight your clients and keep you passionate about our wonderful profession. The Editing Chef is reopening for new students in December, so if you want to learn more and save your spot, visit cuttothepoint.com forward slash TEC. Okay, the break is over. <laughs> let's get <laughs> and we're to back. The <laughs> and we're back. Yeah. Okay, so let's cut to the fourth factor that lets you make more money than your colleagues. And it comes down to trust that you will deliver the product they want, the client want, and do whatever it takes to tell the story, basically. I think that your client needs to have an impression that you will do whatever. If you have to kill someone, you will. I mean, obviously I'm kidding, but <laughs> <laughs> but they want to have the, I, I, I think that if you can prove that the project will mean a lot to you as much as it means to them, then you're in a great position to negotiate. That's what I mean. I don't mean killing anyone or even a fly. Uh, but what I meant is just being ready to do a lot to make the project succeed. I think if you can sell this idea and if you can prove it, and by the way, it needs to be genuine. So it's not like I'm talking about the things you have to fake. If you're in a position where you can actually uh, work with a client that will make you passionate about the project that you will work on, that's when it's relevant. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, every client wants to know that you're in for the long haul or that their project is important, that you're present and know the importance of it. And even despite the client, that's something that as an editor or as somebody who takes pride in their work should feel is important also. Yeah. People will pick up on that if you're being lazy or whatever, or you know, not putting your best foot forward. People will notice that. And in the long run, that's going to hurt you. Yeah, definitely. And also, I think that having that attitude actually helps you to do better work. Because if you think about it as if the way they will look at me depends on how good the result will be, then you will do a better job, basically. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's dependent on you coming into it with a good attitude. And then hopefully you're going to get a good attitude from whoever you're working with, because that's important. That can will reflect upon you. So hopefully you get good clients. <laughs> Exactly. But at the same time, it's still something that even if they are bad clients, you should be doing the best that you can so that you can at least get out of there alive, so to speak. Yeah. I would say that there are no bad clients, but uh, probably there are. I would I would <laughs> say that there are bad clients. <laughs> I've worked for them. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it would be wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. they, they want to go with the fifth point? Yeah. The fifth point is kind of maybe piggybacks on what I had just said. And it's about having a good attitude and I don't want to say dialogue, but being nice, being a good person, being attentive. Yep. You know, this yep. is this is a in a way it's a service industry. You're you're somebody's asking you to do something and you're giving them a service and you're doing the best that you can to make the client, all clients, the client that you're working for and the client that you both are working for, to create a good story, to create a good video. You know, you attract more 
flies with honey than you do with vinegar. So when you go into these places, that is an unfair advantage sometimes, where if you have a good reputation of being a nice guy that people love to see and they love to talk to, then you are going to be the first person that they picked. This isn't me just talking. This is things that I know that clients, I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but clients have actually told me, we picked you for this job because you're personable, because we like you. I mean, that's how you create a network anyways. You create these relationships and those relationships will only thrive in a kind of a positive way rather than like being negative all the time. Yeah. For something that you care about, you actually want to get in the room with people who want to hire you. And your goal should not be to like uh, tell them about all the other projects you worked on and to prove that you did the work, um, a similar work previously. I mean, those things will have to come out as well and they will probably know about it before they invite you to the uh, meeting room anyway. But your goal during the meeting should be to leave the room and have them say, what a great guy, what a great guy. <laughs> and that sounds kind of ridiculous, but it's 100% true. Yeah, if you will be paying someone 500 bucks a day, you want to like that guy basically. So even though it sounds like a bit corny and kind of obvious, it's something that we often forget and we get to that room or on that Zoom call and our goal is to talk about all the things we've done. But other than that, sometimes it's good to, to talk about uh, the client, about what they want, what they need. And you just want to leave that room, that meeting with that, with that thought in their mind. What a great guy or gal. That ensures that you'll get into more meetings, yeah. that you'll be a part about future projects, even more so than the there and now that it's what the future holds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Time for the last factor. And basically... It's having options, in my opinion. So it's a ladder and, you know, the career is, any career is a ladder. So you climb it and, uh, but you have to climb it smart in a way. Uh, and, you know, climbing a ladder, climbing a corporate ladder is actually a bit, sounds a bit negative to me, but uh, I hope you get the point. What I mean is that you want to climb that ladder in a smart way. Because at some point, you want to be able to be picky about the projects you take on. You don't want to be someone who doesn't have those relations built up. You don't want to be someone who's just waiting for new clients to come out, uh, you know, their door and uh, pay you money, basically. You want to be someone who has a strategy and builds relationships and basically that has options, you know, so when, when someone approaches you with a gig and asks you about your availability, you can actually judge, is it something that would suit the projects I want to work on? Is it the project that really makes me excited? Because as we said, you, to sell the idea that you're excited about the project, you do have to be genuinely excited. So you have to find yourself in a position where you are able to be a bit picky and you have alternatives. So I do want to touch on the importance of building multiple streams of income as an editor, because if you're only making money editing for clients, then you probably won't have any options when someone approaches you with a new project. But if you do have these other sources, if you do something on your own and or you have a retainer client that, that pays you monthly and fee, or things like that, you don't have to accept every gig. And with those possibilities, you can be picky and you can charge more, basically. If you have more pokers in the fire, then you have more options. Although, depending on how overwhelmed you like to be with the projects that you're working on, <laughs> that's yeah. a different discussion, but it's always nice to have something else that you can fall back on in case the one client or the one job that you were working on kind of dries up yeah. for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have options, then, you know, a client says, okay, I'll pay you this much. And you say, okay, I'll get it. <laughs> but if you have options, you, you, you'll you say, sorry, I, I can't work for this much. I, I, I need more uh, just because, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, based off of your reputation, based off yeah. of the client's needs, all those things will factor in to how much you can ask for and how much the client is willing to pay you. 
Yeah. And it also depends on budget and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, I think our goal with this podcast is to make people realize and to, our, to realize ourselves in a way as well, that there are things we can do to be able to charge more. And it takes, it takes time. It's not like you can charge more tomorrow. I mean, with some things you can, but uh, generally it should be part of your strategy. And uh, yeah, that's what I think we wanted to highlight. And I do hope that listeners did get some good advice and a good use of it. I hope so also. Being proactive is really the key to any success. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, <laughs> now what? <laughs> Okay, that's it. In two weeks, we'll be airing the interview with Frances Parker. She's an editor for uh, B- Band of Brothers, which actually she won an Emmy for. Uh, she also edited a few episodes of Game of Thrones and uh, The Crown. Uh, so she, she's a very accomplished editor, very experienced one. So stay tuned for that. If you like what you've heard, please rate, review, and subscribe at whatever podcast platform you've listened to this on. Your reviews help more people discover this show. And if you have any questions or comments, send them to podcast at cuttothepoint.com. And who knows, maybe we'll use them in the future episodes. And that's it. (laughs) Thanks, everybody. (laughs) Have a great day. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. Cut Reveal is a sub-brand of Cut to the Point. To learn more about what we do, including some premium resources for editors, visit cuttothepoint.com or just find the Cut to the Point channel on YouTube.